Hi everyone, this is Dr. A. We're going to continue with our toxicology basics um, and TDM therapeutic ranges um, and sample timing is what we're going to look at right now. Okay, so this plays into how do we interpret drug concentrations. So you have to address these following points. So first you have to know the therapeutic range. So uh, those are often established um, between the manufacturer and the lab, et cetera, and meth methodology. So it usually is on the lab report. There is something that's been predetermined um, where the low level of the therapeutic range would be basically anything below that low end of the therapeutic range would be uh, not effective. And then on the high end of the therapeutic range, anything above the high end of that therapeutic range uh, would be considered toxic. Um, and so um, also within uh, that therapeutic range, um, they might be a, a certain level that is better for the patient. And so uh, for that patient, what's their ideal uh, level within within the established therapeutic range um, that's been established by the lab and the manufacturer, what's the best for the patients. Um, and so, um, you know, more personalized there within uh, above efficacy and below toxicity, right? So sample timing, are there specific times that the laboratory must draw the specimen? And we're going to be discussing this in a little bit more detail, but just to give you an idea would be like, do we draw the specimen uh, before they take their next dose? So where the levels in the blood are at the lowest, or do uh, we draw it in a certain time interval after a patient has taken their dose so that it is at peak concentration in the blood? What, what, what are we checking? What's the timing? And when is the patient normally taking their medication, et cetera? And then of course, specimen collection methodology and assays. So, was the appropriate specimen collected? Um, serum, plasma, whole blood, what type of anticoagulant, if any, should be used? So do we use no anticoagulant because it interferes with the assay? And then therefore we would do serum, um, it, or do we use um, lithium heparin, uh, and is that okay? And there's even another factor here. There are, um, within collection tubes, there's a uh, gel serum separated tubes, there's a gel in the, that tube and um, you collect the blood and mix it and then uh, spin it down. The gel settles between the cells in the plasma or the serum. Well, there are some drugs that could get trapped in the gel and like you cannot use a serum separated tube to uh, test for those specific drugs. So it is really, really important to pay attention to uh, the collection label. Uh, that is printed because it will always have the correct tube that needs to be collected for that test. Uh, and then how will the test be run in the laboratory? So what instrumentation are they using and within the instrumentation, what methodology? Uh, and the biggest thing I want you to remember about this is that um, oftentimes uh, instrumentation and methodologies will vary between labs from one lab to the next and that their ranges could even be slightly different from one lab to the next and usually if you're training a patient over time and so looking at their results over time within the therapeutic ranges that are on the report um, you, you cannot compare one lab with a different lab like you want to stay within the same uh, analyzer and methodology if you want to compare over time. So, um, and uh, the use of levels for dosage adjustments, um, th this is specifically referring to trough and peak levels, and we're going to discuss that. So trough levels would be the lowest level uh, in the blood and peak the highest levels in the blood, like which ones do we need? Um, there's been some trends in those to go simply just to peak levels and not worry about the trough levels, uh, but it, that, again, that can vary from one hospital to the next uh, across the nation and across the world. So what is a therapeutic range? So it's a range of drug concentration within which the probability of the desired clinical response is relatively high and the probability of the unacceptable toxicity is relatively low. So above efficacy, below toxicity. This is, that's the therapeutic range. So it's the amount of the drug that can be given to a patient to bring about positive effects without harming the patient. And again, we only do therapeutic range, um, therapeutic drug monitoring in patients that are taking medications where 
the levels like between therapeutic and toxic it's very it's very easy to cross between one and the other okay so therapeutic ranges are usually they're predetermined um, by the manufacturers by the um, manufacturers of, of the analyzer and the reagents for that specific assay uh, and all patients have their own drug dos dosage to fit their own therapeutic levels because they, they can have different health problems and different health issues. Again, this is where individual variations come in. And so uh, the physicians and the nurses must work closely with the lab to determine what the correct dosage for the correct therapeutic level is for that patient within, you know, the, the therapeutic range. So that we definitely, you know, above efficacy, below toxicity, but like what's optimal within those numbers for that patient and that's what you want to find. So what are things that could affect the therapeutic range or really the therapeutic level for that patient? So uh, the indication, so why the drug is different. So different conditions require a greater or lower amount of the drug for treatment. So for example, mortadoxin is needed to treat atrial fibrillation and congestive heart failure. And so um, what a therapeutic level would be uh, in one patient being treated for um, atrial fibrillation is going to be different than the um, therapeutic level needed for somebody with congestive heart failure. Uh, are there active metabolites present? So um, when you give a patient a drug, the liver is automatically going to start met metabolizing that drug. And uh, in some drugs, um, it has to be metabolized into uh, the uh, metabolites and those have a therapeutic effect. Um, and so um, those active metabolites could raise or lower the therapeutic um, level for that patient. Um, so is that something that um, is a concern? And again, that would be totally determined by um, the liver function of that patient. Concurrent drug treatments, other medications that the patient is taking can affect the therapeutic level of the drug being monitored because, again, um, drugs can compete for detoxification. Sometimes uh, two drugs together, it might enhance the detoxification of one or slow the detoxification of another. Um, and it could also um, have effects on absorption uh, if they're orally administered drugs. And um, so there's, there's definitely... Um, whenever, whenever there's polypharmacy, there, you know, there are factors that can affect um, the dosage and the levels and um, what's going on. The age of the patient. Um, again, with that, um, we have the age of you know, the liver, how easy they can detoxify, but also anything that's orally administered, whether they can um, absorb it properly. So those are all um, things that can be affected by age. Uh, electrolyte status, um, elevated or uh, decreased, uh, electrolyte levels could increase or decrease the effectiveness of certain drugs, uh, especially some of the drugs like digoxin um, that can affect the heart. And so if the, your patient's dehydrated or is missing a certain electrolyte, uh, sometimes that can affect uh, the effectiveness of the drug. And so in that instance, obviously, correcting the electrolyte imbalance is what you want to do. But it is good to know the electrolyte status if um, there are signs of inefficacy of the drug or signs of toxicity of the drug. So concurrent disease. Um, giving a patient medication to treat a disease may not be as effective because of an other disease or another underlying problem. For example, a patient that has underlying heart disease may be more sensitive to digoxin while another patient with thyroid disease may have an altered response to the same drug. Again, with thyroid, it would depend. Um, if they have too much thyroid hormone, they might be uh, like hyper metabolizing and metabolizing it super fast because if you have too much thyroid, all your metabolic process go faster. If you have hypothyroid and not enough thyroid hormone, then everything is slowed down. The metabolism is slowed down, meaning detoxification would be slowed down. The effect, all of that could be slowed down. So these could um, definitely affect. So what's going on with the patient? Again, the health of the patient can affect this. And um, variable ratios of enantiomers. So an enantiomer is one of two stereoisomers that are mirror images of each other like your right and left hands, right? And some drugs are given as a mixture of enantiomers, 
which means the patient's response or toxicity levels could be dependent on the proportion of those enantiomers. And then I would even say on that, that uh, there could be, the formulas could be slightly different between generic and brand names, etc. cetera. So um, those are things that, um, you know, the formulation of the drug itself and the brand name and versus generic, et cetera, who makes it, all of that could play into um, how the patient metabolizes it and whether this is uh, effective for them or it's toxic. Uh, there are also variable genotypes. So we've already hinted at that. So um, there is a way to test for that with uh, so some of the new genomic testing. And a patient's response to some drugs could be genetically determined. So some patients can be genotyped before beginning, beginning treatment to determine if they would be a non-responder, a responder, or a toxic responder. Um, I know for sure that uh, one of the practical applications of that has been in Coumadin or warfarin therapy, since so it's more in the realm of coagulation uh, studies, but um, that's one way you can find um, uh, the difference in responses and you can do the genotypes. So that, the uh, medical world is definitely working on increasing the availability of those tests for um, personalized medicine so that we can find um, the right medications for the patients according to their genotype. And then um, there can be some variations in serum protein binding. So what you have to understand here is that whenever drugs enter the bloodstream, especially if they're lipid-soluble drugs, a portion of that drug is going to be bound up on protein, especially albumin, and some of it's going to be floating freely. Okay. So patients could sometimes exhibit signs and symptoms of toxicity, even when the lab results indicate that their drug level is within therapeutic range. So this is because when we test the drug levels, we test the total level in the blood, meaning we're going to test what's bound to protein and what's free altogether. Okay. So getting the total level doesn't tell you how much is protein bound and how much is free. And if normally the patient was like maybe 50-50, so half protein bound and half free, and that was working for them, and then something affected their ability to produce the protein, so maybe their liver's being affected, their liver was damaged or something, and they can't produce the protein as much, and all of a sudden now we have 30% bound to protein and 70% free, well, that 70% free is going to have a greater therapeutic uh, effect and could be uh, causing toxicity effects. And uh, it's simply related to the amount of it that is protein bound has changed. Um, and so um, if these individuals have abnormally low protein binding and high concentration of the unbound drug, then um, they could cause, that could cause them to exhibit toxicity. Um, uh, there's uh, either, this could be again because the patient's not making enough protein levels, or it could be that um, also there might be another substance that's uh, displacing the drug that's been protein bound, making more of it free, and uh, therefore more of it having a therapeutic or a um, effect on uh, the binding sites that it's supposed to bind to. And then sample timing. So uh, the most frequent source of errors when therapeutic drug monitoring results do not agree with the clinical picture is incorrect timing of sample collection. Uh, and so this is where collaboration between lab, physician, and nurses is super important. So there are a couple of considerations for sample timing. So first, how long to wait after the initiation of the dosage treatment or the adjustment in that dosage regimen. So um, the patient was given their drugs at noon, and um, it's been determined by the manufacturer that a level should be drawn eight hours later, or six hours later, or two hours later, or 30 minutes later, something like that, right? So what's the timing there? And uh, also when to obtain the specimen during the dosing interval. So um, meaning do we take it a specific time after the administration or before the next dose, so like when. So what I, what I want you to think about here is that whenever you work with uh, nursing staff is and lab staff is that um, the, the nursing staff has a window to administer a drug, right? And um, 
and also if the patient's taking the drug like they may not take it like exactly at like at noon they have to supposed to take it at noon well they may take it at 11 30 or the, the nurse may be able to give that drug at 11 30 to that patient right and then uh, so let's say then there's a lab order to have this done at 2 p.m. Uh, for a drug that would have been given at noon and uh, the drug is given 30 minutes earlier by the nursing staff because they, according to the protocol, they can do that, right? Uh, but then lab, the lab could collect it uh, a little early or a little late. There's, again, there's a window of time where it's appropriate to collect it. So uh, let's say the nurse gives the drug early and the lab collects the sample late. Well, they could be almost like three hours then between the time it was given to and the time the the levels were collected, then that could affect the interpretation of the results. So a steady state is a condition in which the rate of the drug that enters the body is equal to the rate of it leaving the body, of it being eliminated. So um, definitely uh, you want the patient to be in a steady state before you start checking their levels and uh, so that you know where where they've leveled off at and they can get maximum benefit without toxicity. For certain drugs, um, that might take a few hours, a few days, but uh, it could take a few weeks or a month or two, all right, to reach steady state. So a trough level, it's the minimum steady state concentration. So it's the lowest level of the medicine in the patient's system during a dosing interval. And usually the specimen should be drawn about 30 minutes before the drug is given again. So it's the lowest level before you give the next dose. Um, so if uh, this is especially pertinent to IV antibiotics, so let's say maybe it's something that's given every 12 hours uh, and we want to check it every third dose. Well, on the third dose, what's going to happen is 30 minutes before they, they give that third dose, then um, they will check those levels. So we have to have the sample drawn. Again, timing in cooperation with nursing is super important. So draw that trough level, which is the lowest level, and then give, hang the antibiotic, give the antibiotic. And then a lot of times then it's followed with a peak level, which is the maximum steady state concentration. So it's the highest level of a medication in a patient's system during a dosing interval. And the collection time will vary with the medication and the method of administration. So uh, IV, uh, administration usually uh, then there's a small window uh, like sometimes 30 minutes or an hour um, but if it's uh, an oral dose it can be uh, a, you know measured in hours um, so generally accepted specimen collection times are as follows so something is given orally check it 90 minutes later so that's an hour and a half um, if it's intramuscular, it's 60 minutes later, and if it's IV, it's 30 minutes later. So um, again, if a, a nurse hung an IV antibiotic at 3 p.m. and it ran over 30 minutes, and so at 3.30 it's done administra as administrating or running in, uh, then we want to wait another 30 minutes, so then we'd be 4 p.m. Uh, before we draw the peak level for that antibiotic. Okay, so the package inserts from the drug manufacturers usually provide the recommended times for the collections of peak level specimens, um, and that information will always be used when you determine the appropriate sample collection times. And so again, cooperation between nursing and lab is super important to get the uh, right results or the correct results, results at least that benefit the patient, right? And then lastly, examples of drugs that are monitored with TDMs. So uh, there's digoxin, which is a heart medication. There's gentamicin, tobramycin, and vancomycin, which are all antibiotics. There's theophylline, which is uh, used to open up lungs, it's a bronchodilator. And then there's also carbamazepine, valproic acid, and phenytoin, and those are all anti-seizure drugs. Those are simply the most frequently ordered. There are more than this, but if you at least know these, then you have your basic ones there covered. All right, well, that wraps it up. Thank you so much.